new millennium, huh? It's the same bullshit. Just done over. Same bullshit. I see. <laughs> we are not come to wage a strife with swords upon his heel. It is not wise to waste a life against a stubborn will. Yet will we die as some have done, beating away for the rising sun? What does that say to y'all? Did y'all catch that? I'm going I'm to I'm slow it down. I'm not going to say it's pretty this time. <laughs> we are not come to wage a strife with swords upon this hill. It is not wise to waste the life against a stubborn will. Yet we die as some have done beating a way for the rising sun. Hmm. Y'all talk to me now. I feel like that speaks to the time now of like kind of the idea of like sometimes we spend so much time trying to get other audiences to understand mm. and, yeah. to, and to be like I want them to see why. And I think that's one thing I love about James Baldwin is like he understood but they may not understand. Um, and we have to create those systems. It's like you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time because they're not going to acknowledge that because to acknowledge that would, would mean to acknowledge something that they don't want to see. And so, you know, and that's mm. what James Baldwin said. He, he said, mm. he was like, the, the the fate of America is tied into the fate of the Negro. Mm -hmm. And for you to call me a nigger, you have to you have to justify why you needed me to be a nigger. Mm -hmm. And to digest that alone until you're able to deal with that, you can't move forward. So if you're not, then you're kind of wasting your time. And I think so even in contemporary times, even with Trump, people are like, ah, this is how I feel, this is what I'm doing. But it's like, you're beating at this drum, you're beating at this point <clears throat> of like, what's going on? But historically, it's been said that actually African-American communities have thrived the most under the worst president. Exactly. Because it was, clear, exactly. it was clear to us that, okay, we're in this thing together, and you see that. You know, going back to what you were saying about the Katy Perry that I think is very powerful, he even talks about tradition. Right, so the Centennials, which your daughter is in that class of Centennials, mm. their parents' parents beat that information about them, mm. right? Yeah. So then when they grew up, they rejected it. So this new millennial and Centennial class that are at these, that want to go to the HBCUs are interested because they didn't hear those stories. They're hungry for it because they didn't hear those stories. Exactly. And we were hungry for it, but our parents didn't tell those stories because they were taught not to talk about it. Mm. So people don't talk about their life before. Mm. Mama, what happened when you was a kid? You yeah. know, even my dad is sitting next to me. He he only brings up a story if it has a purpose in telling me something. Mm. But he's not the person that's just like, back in the day, this is how it was. Right. So I think that what's happening yeah. is, in wow. a, beautiful, a beautiful and, and beautiful wow. and bizarre way, is that it's kind of a blank canvas in a scary way. Because if your daughter sees that, and that's an appropriation, and she sees that as original, that's her first image. But then if we don't take the time to also kind of nourish that curiosity, then it is really appropriate for us to kind of give that information to it. But I think that this generation is coming with a different type of purity and, 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 and honest curiosity that's going to transcend a lot of the barriers that we can't even see past. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, a lot of these kids, even though they see that, some kids really don't see color. <clears throat> and as weird as that is, when I kind of, so I'm just like, man, we like the same thing. Interest is enough for them. But what's interesting about that is like, even though they don't see color, I can still see. It's it's kind of like my the, the the talk we was having at um <laughs> at, the, at the artist talk we was having, and it was just kind of like I gave the example of how my grandparents talked, how my dad generation talked, and how I talked to my children. And the language is more PC, more PC, more PC over the generations and over the ages, but yet the wealth still remains on this side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. So it's just like they're they're coming into this world with these millennial and centennial eyes of like naivete and I don't, you know, I don't see color and I don't see all this stuff, but yet you're gonna be kind of walking into like a lion's den, you know what I'm saying? 
But at the same time, I don't want to put that on you. Right. I don't want to be putting all this weight on you. So it's just it's 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 a very fine line to walk, you know. And I have babies. I they five and eight. So it's like I know I don't want to put all that weight on them. You know what I'm saying? But it's it's real. This is kind of like when I was in a department store. I was in a department store with my son, and he's five. He just you know superhero crazy. He just like you know just got that energy coming out of him. And uh, but when I go into a store, I'm trying to be undetectable. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't, I don't want the radar to get on me and start following me around and stuff. So the eyes be on me. So when I'm in there with my son, he's going to automatically be loud. He's going to jump around. He's going to do things to put the radar on us. But I know once the radar is on us, the eyes are going to start doing this and doing that. But it goes back to the poem. How much of energy and how much of sword wielding do I want to do to try to... All right, let me not look like I'm doing nothing. Let me not look like I'm being black. Let me not, you know what I'm saying? It's, right. do, it's doing too much. Right. It's like, it's too much energy. You know what I'm saying? Let me not try to act like this. Let me not try to act like that. You know, it's just like, and then try to put that on him too. Mm -hmm. It's just too much. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's why I'm starting to paint images like this. That's why that conversation was very important, what we had at the, at the gallery that time, because now it's just time for us to start having these conversations without shame. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If you have a shame, you have to question why you have shame. It's kind of like, why did you need to make a nigga in the first place? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And, and that also goes when you talk about the economic structure. Like, I was sitting in a meeting with, uh, we did the meeting with, uh, about uh, gentrification uh, in North Nashville. And it was an honest mm -hmm. conversation that was like, a lot of, which sometimes it's not a conversation that's had, is that, Grandma had that house, right? In the 70s, she had that house. She told her daughter and her son, I'm leaving this house to you. Mm -hmm. That daughter and son said, hell no. I don't want to live in Nashville. I want to move to New York. I want to move to California. I want to move to the suburbs. So you have to, you have to understand when white flight happened, black flight afterwards slowly happened, right? So then that property, no one wants it. So now when they're reimagining downtown or North Nashville and this property is up for sale, it's something on the portfolio. So selling it, it's, it's not a sacred space anymore. So I'm saying that to say that there is some gaps within our community where we haven't kept those legacies, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with kids, right? When my dad used to give me thrift store shit, I used to be so mad, you know what I'm saying? Like that wasn't cool to go to Goodwill. The millennials, they spend triple the amount for buying stuff from Goodwill. Vintage is like, they see these dilapidated buildings and they're like, oh my God. And they create these whole narrations in their mind. So they're able to reimagine these neighborhoods in ways I've never seen, right? So it's a generational gap. And so some of that, mm -hmm. some of those things that have happened have happened because it's been some displacement on our side. And I said that, you know, a lot of times it's like, do we really care about grandma's house? And if grandma wanted to sell that house because she couldn't go up and down them stairs mm. and she paid $80,000 for it 40 years ago and they were giving her $300,000 and she wanted to live her life, is she wrong? But more than that, how long have these houses been sitting here and no one reimagined them? Why does it have to be threatened before we say, no, we need to come together and buy that? Well, damn it, you've been walking and pissing on the side of the, the store, that, that brick forever. So I think those are some internal conversations that are not had. Yeah. So yeah, I can hear those conversations mm. when people are like, no, we got to fight in there. Gentrification yeah. is a system that we try to put human qualities to. Mm -hmm. But what about grandma? What about the programming? Gentrification mm. deals with uh, proximity from downtown, mm. walkability, mm. It, those are the words that, that urban planners and, 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 and they use. We put, but that's what I had. I was baptized in that bathtub, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I think that's the thing, too, is like you said, meeting that, and we have to understand you can't fight a machine mm. in that type of way. Right. You know what I mean? And I think that's a realization that's happening. And so, but it also has to be some conversations, like we said, with the older generation. How many older black folks owned property on Jefferson and just sat on it and waited for gentrification? Mm. How many old folks wait? I, I, they didn't trust the younger generation because you didn't know enough. They don't trust people that come to buy the property because I don't trust you. So they wait to coach you out, level out your floors, and take it from you. 
or wait till you die. So I think some things is like there weren't plans put together. And we're kind of getting those strands of that kind of calling out later. And so I think the conversation now is like, it has to be, and every time I'm in, you know, we're in conversation, some conversations can't be had in certain circles because mm. they're insulated, but those are conversations we have to really have. Mm. Like, do you really value, and I say this a lot of times when people always <clears throat> look at me crazy, but it's a common joke that people say, right? The white folks walking down the street, walking their dog, but she wa wearing the yoga pants. And I said, the truth is, is it that you're mad at her or is there envy that she has this false sense of protection mm. in a neighborhood that you're scared to walk down, that you lived in all your life? I have a, I have a whole different perspective on it. Not, not to say that uh, I, I disagree with you, but to say that I want you to look at it from a different sense. Um, not because I hear us talking about it as a left or right game, right? And I rarely think of the world in like black or white. Right. Um, and for me, as, as someone that studies psych and sociology, it's all about like how are we perceiving life. And so I think about, I, I think about it in the sense that we're really, the, the struggle is a, is a mental struggle right. for self. Right. How we acknowledge ourselves and our self worth because we acknowledge the worth of our communities and we acknowledge the worth of ourselves, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter how much we can make off of this by selling it, how much, or how much, uh, well, yes, the value, the historic value will always be there, but there's always a continuous value that, that can be passed on, inheritance. What I've learned about, um, what I've learned about getting wealthier is, it's, it's really not just the material. Right. It's it's so up here, thinking wealthy. Um, I, I I'm very confident. I work a, I work a nine to five job. Well, I don't work nine to five those hours. I work at night, but I work a, a blue collar job, right? I work a blue collar job at FedEx FedEx office. But where I, I come in, I, I've grown wealthy by my circle, not because I have more money right now, but I I know people of great value. I know people, mm -hmm. and and the things they introduce me to right. have have got me thinking wealthier. And so now that I'm at my job, that you know, at one time I was like, man, I need to get out of here. I need to do something better. Or, or I'm, I'm seeing folks going to say 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Like I mean, 20 years. Yeah, I'm like, uh, I don't want to do that. But, but now that I'm there, I'm like, man, I'm meeting folks all the time at FedEx. I'm meeting this doctor from Vanderbilt. I'm meeting this young man that's an intern at this foundation in Germantown. Oh, that's my community. Oh, okay. So what's your foundation do? Well, we like to support youth businesses. We like to support education. We like to support cultural and wildlife. Um, do you do anything of that nature? Well, yeah, I do a lot of things of that nature. Uh, how, how can we, well, call me this day. I'll set you up in a meeting and we'll see. I mean, we only invest $2 million. So if you, as long as you can take $2 million investment, I'm like, well, what do we need for that? Um, like, what's the, what do I need for a $2 million investment? Like, well, I mean, you definitely need nonprofit licensure, but. Those conversations would have passed me by because I wouldn't have even thought to ask him anything more than, uh, do, you, do you need anything else with that? Right. Do you need, and let him walk out the door. And so when you start thinking with the different, it's like, uh, they, they talk a lot about people, um, not Bill Gates, I don't want to talk about, uh, what's the brother that made Apple? Um, Steve, Steve Jobs. Jobs, right? May Apple sold it, got, got, got uh, bought out by his own team. But people, once, once they get to a certain level of wealth, in their mind and knowing their own self, they can be broke the next day and give them a year, they'll be wealthy again. Mm. Because they understand, they understand their own self value, they understand how to navigate and how to how to really channel channel opportunity because they understand their own <laughs> self-worth. And so what I think the issue is with why gentrification is coming through isn't just because, okay, one community is coming in, another community is coming out. It's not just white folks coming in, black folks coming out. It's people of wealth people outside the community are coming in that necessarily don't know the history, and some, some care to know the history, some don't care to learn the history, right? But we're gonna make money on it. There's a lot of black gentrifiers, a whole lot of black gentrifiers out right. here, right? But then there's a lot of folks in the community like, I love Dr. Harris, and Mr. Harris, right? Nathaniel Harris, who's like, I've been here 30, 40 years, and I'm so glad that this opportunity is coming through because, hey, their dollar spend just like our dollar spend, but you know what? When, when they come to our, my door, they don't just come in and say, oh, I was expecting to see Red Ridley, but I saw this amazing, this amazing uh, 
uh, uh, Aaron Douglas piece and for $4,000 and I'll buy it today because they support. And so that the gentrification doesn't have to be just a fight or flight, it doesn't have to be a no, battle and, and I think if, that, if we're thinking differently. But I think that also goes to the idea of what you're talking about is cultural capital. Right. So how do we quantify that? Why are you not saying our own? Yeah. How, 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 let me illustrate it because I, I think you, you can say that's an old trick. <laughs> and what it is, uh, it's, it's this integrationist mindset. Like you, you thought because you were in their proximity, you would be able to tap into their social capital. Know that it's a system in place structurally where they already know 30 years in advance what they're gonna do with the area. They know who paying their bills, who ain't, who paid up on their taxes, who bill and ain't up the code. So they're not just coming in, oh, I just wanted to come in and get a look at this. <laughs> they already been taking That's pictures. Right. I saw the, the 12 South Severe Park Master Plan 10 years ago when I was still in LA. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a dump then. Cause I, I came in 2010, they said, man, if you would've seen 12 South, it was the no. best hookers in town. <laughs> 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 and I was like, you mean what the people walking up and down the street with ice cream and getting yeah. slices of yeah. pizza? <laughs> and I think I think you should listen to what, what, what Mike had to say. Uh, I think he had mentioned um, people not really valuing what bread my hand. You know, I, I came here from Sorry. Chattanooga. <laughs> Pearl Cone to compete against Pearl Cone and Memphis Melrose mm. in skills competitions. Mm. And my father and my uncles are like master brick masons, plumbers, electricians. He said they came here and got their ass kicked from, from people at Pearl. Mm. And so, how is it that you went to a school that taught you all the industrial arts? It's people who are still alive who can tell you who, who built these buildings. And then all of a sudden, well, we ain't got to worry about him in here in Grandma House because he ain't going to be able to fix nothing in it. Mm. And all we got to do is come and offer him more money up front than he ever saw or give it to his grandmother, give her life estate. That's when they give her cash up front. Mm -hmm. And then when she die, they get they the profit. Yeah. So this is what happened in Chattanooga. This is what happened in Oakland, California, Newark, New Jersey, Oakland, California. Where are the black brick masons? Because it's very interesting because it's like, oh, to, to feed off that that thing, y'all, uh, you know, that article we were talking about earlier, that I just spit all over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, the, the no. lady, no, yeah, the lady, lady who I talked am. about Emmett Till, she's still alive. Mm. And yeah, so that story is out right now. But but that's but that just goes on to say what you were just saying. It's just like this stuff is still relevant, man. This stuff is still relevant. I and think, it's I, I think Joe got on a good point though. Yeah, yeah.